Thank you, Frank. Um, well, I'm actually going to be operating under a pseudonym for the, this session. My name is going to be uh, Craig David Eagle, uh, and uh, you'll see why in a moment. Uh, just a little bit of a... Uh, I, given the audience, um, there is the possibility that quite a lot of you have no idea who Craig David is. So just, uh, just to give you an indication of... Uh, uh, of so let's leave it there. So this um, is going to be a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, through some of the, uh, the elements, but it's effectively a, an FME cloud uh, story. Um, and I want to take you on the, the journey that um, was a, uh, a week's uh, project that, uh, that I went through. Um, Monday morning, I'm not really a morning person, and this particular Monday uh, was uh, uh, pretty typical, really. Um, I found that... Um, Often Monday morning is all about inbox digging, digging out all the content that's the spam that's turned up over the weekend and largely the things that uh, you really should have done last week uh, that you're trying to get your, uh, your head around. But there was a, a really interesting email sitting in my inbox this, uh, this Monday uh, and it was sort of winking out at me uh, with a, a, bit of, uh, a bit of extra detail and a bit of, a bit of in extra interest in that. Um, and I, I'm sure some of you are pretty aware that um, if you go onto SAFE's website, there's uh, a lot of uh, very useful information. Uh, and a, a little while ago now, actually, they introduced uh, a live chat, the little orange uh, symbol down in the bottom corner, um, that most of people in Europe don't really see uh, until sort of 4.30, 5.30 in the afternoon uh, when the guys over here wake up uh, and then it changes and it pops up and you have the opportunity to ask uh, questions via the live chat function. Uh, and the email that was in my inbox was quite exciting because it was a transcript from a live chat that had been sent to me. Uh, and it had been forwarded across and uh, uh, it was uh, sent over by uh, um, one of the guys, Xiao Ming, who sits on the, uh, the live chat desk. I know. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, and um, th there's, a, there's a couple of individuals that, uh, that sit, and I chatted uh, in detail with, uh, with Richard last night, who's also on the, on the desk. Um, and um, the live chat transcript went as follows. So uh, uh, James was the guy who'd uh, put in the request, and uh, he said, so um, how's it going? Hi, and James. I'm doing well. How are you? There we go. And uh, Xiao Ming just dived in there, and I said, well, I'm building a web map for a, a client using ArcGIS Online, and uh, the client wants live shipping data fed into the map. So that was the, the key thing. Are you new to FME? Well, yeah, I mean, totally. I just came across it today. I've been watching some vids online. Uh, I'm not sure you should be telling me that, James. So... <laughs> There's a little bit of artistic license here. Um, most of this actually happened. Um, would FME Server require running on in-house hardware? Yes, it runs on promise uh, on your server machine. Okay, well, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to swing that with IT. Um, oh, there you go. Uh, let me put you through to uh, our local partner of ours. Well, I'm based in the UK. Uh, David Eagle at One Spatial would be a one good person to talk to. Okay, well, any chance of a call tomorrow? Because I'm in a bit of a rush. <laughs> so, Monday, I needed to get some caffeine. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on with the flashing, but uh, uh, anyway, I, um, I, I had a drink. Uh, maybe that's where I'm standing, do you think? We can, um, but I need my bag. Oh, we could leave it. Is it annoying? Ah, yeah, that's the. I've got one here. So let's swap over. Take that. Thank you. try. So sorry about that. You can always go back to analog. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I have the caffeine. Um, Usually when I have caffeine, I, I tend to have tea because it, it's a little bit milder. I do funny things on coffee, but um, uh, I, I decided that I'd look for some inspiration. So I thought, well, what, what would Craig David do? Now, the odd thing is that um, Craig is relaunching his career right now. Um, and uh, it was coincidental, entirely coincidental. Um, in the early 2000s, Craig busted into the UK uh, R&B scene. Uh, and he, he had a couple of years of real great success. Um, and I know that some of you are sitting there looking at me and thinking, Dave, you really don't look like a sort of UK garage R&P kind of guy. And you'd sort of be right, but stay with me. Um, so he's decided to um, relaunch his career. A, a UK comedian uh, sort of destroyed it, actually, over a, a series of, uh, of months, uh, had his own uh, comedy show that ripped into, uh, in, into Craig David. Um, so he disappeared off to Miami and drove fast cars and relaxed for a while, and now he's relaunching his career. And he decided to choose Amazon Cloud to serve up his ticketing system. So I thought, okay, well, we'll leave that for later. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the cloud environment, this Amazon Cloud environment, has got something going for it. So I took this, um, this scenario a little bit further, and I thought, well, I wonder what he's like at project management. <laughs> so I, I looked into the lyrics of the song that I played you at the start, and the song's called Seven Days, if you haven't already worked that out. And he goes through a scenario, uh, and I thought, read into his lyrics, and he met this girl on Monday, and he took her for a drink on Tuesday. And, well, on Wednesday, he, I guess... The best way of putting this is he entered the delivery phase of his project. Um, he submitted his project inception docu document and, you know, things, things were going well. And I, I, I carried on looking at this and the first time I read his lyrics, I thought, well, he, and then he relaxed for the rest of the week. But actually, if you think about it and look at it in a bit more detail, well, he was delivering for quite a few days and then he relaxed on Sunday. Um, so the requirements of the project... Um, when we dug into the detail was that it was a, an Esri AGOL, uh, ArcGIS Online map, uh, that was where the data needed to go. Um, the customer had a whole bunch of contextual mapping, they had a whole bunch of uh, utility and asset data that needed to display. But the kicker for them was that they needed live positional uh, data of a fleet of vessels. Um, and importantly, that fleet could change over time. Uh, they had different vessels uh, included in the, uh, in, the, in the group of vehicles that they needed to map. And it was around regulatory reasons that they had to do it. They had to um, log the position of these vessels so that um, uh, they made sure that they were only operating in the allowable area. Um, and importantly, they also had to look after the, the history uh, of where the vessels had been so that at any point in time they could extract the, uh, the historic position uh, of those vessels. And an interesting aspect of the project was that they wanted to be able to switch it off at the end of the year. Um, so no more um, cost must be incurred after that point. Uh, and James has already highlighted through his chat to Xiaoming that uh, uh, absolutely it couldn't be an on-premise solution, um, largely around the fact that the system needed to be live at the end of the week. Uh, and it was one of these um, scenarios where you know, it's a little bit of a joke around the, uh, the, the whole seven days thing, but it, it was a, a real timeline that we had to work with. Um, I look back to Craig David, and uh, it, it was very clear that you can achieve quite a lot in a week, so uh, I, I used him as my inspiration. Um, the source data that we looked at um, leveraging was AIS data. If those of you have come across it, it's a effectively content that's published via... Uh, VHF radio and satellite transceivers on uh, vessels around the world uh, to uh, effectively avoid collisions. Um, so, um, and there's, there's sort of equivalent technology for all sorts of vehicles, uh, aeroplanes included. Uh, this is the kind of tech that sits in the, uh, on the bridge of the vessel. This is the kind of control center view that you might, uh, might be familiar with. Um, and I had a look at uh, what our options were, and AIS data is supported... Uh, natively in FME. We can dive out to the FME Readers and Writers Manual uh, and see that here. So you can see there's a, 
uh, the ability. But the key thing here is that the reader provides FME with access to AIS messages that have been saved as text or a log file. Now, actually, we had no opportunity to sort of go and, or we didn't really want to develop anything to go and scrape content and stick it on disk in a particular location and then read it from there. So we, we decided that we'd go for an AEPI wrapper sitting around the AIS data. And when we used a, a service called Marine Traffic, um, if you happen to be a, a vessel tracking or airplane tracking anorak like I've become, um, these websites are, are really fun. Um, there's quite a lot of clickbait on them quite a lot of times. You've got to be careful what, uh, what you click on. You might end buying car insurance or something. But uh, uh, you can see that the, the vessels have a bunch of metadata. And they're kind of um, crowdsourcing environments as well. So if you like taking photographs of boats, uh, you can uh, uh, have an account and log in. But you've got where they're going from and to and a whole bunch of metadata about the vessels themselves. Um, but importantly, uh, a lot of these services have an API. Uh, so different types, you can go and get an individual, individual vessel's positions, uh, position, you can go and get a fleet uh, with a request, all sorts of variations here. Um, and there's Android and um, uh, Apple uh, apps uh, that have got virtual reality elements, so you can sit on, stand on a coastline and point your phone at the boat and find out where it's going from and to, and there's equivalent um, Flight Radar 24 is the aeroplane one, which is pretty cool, so uh, you see where, uh, where planes are going. Um, so, well, Craig David, he, he took it for a drink on Tuesday, and um, uh, Craig David Eagle um, proposed a technical solution. And, and we, you can see very quickly that Craig and I were very different people. Um, so we, we put together a, a scenario where effectively we'd, we'd read the marine traffic data uh, from the API, write it out to ArcGIS Online, and because we had to have a, effectively a rolling update, we wanted to see where the boats were moving to, we'd effectively just load one record per boat and truncate the table on load, so there's a little option to effectively empty the table, replace it with the new vessel location. Um, but we would also sort of push off an archive position, the same record would get loaded into, a, uh, into an archive table, and we chose Google Fusion tables. Uh, more on that in a moment, because uh, that was a, a pretty cool discovery, actually. Um, and then we would spin up the smallest FME Cloud instance uh, that you can, a uh, nice standard uh, or starter instance um, with just a couple of cores and a little bit of memory. And we built a process that we would then run every two minutes. Um, and um, we realized through a lot of testing that we also wanted to then start issuing notifications because we wanted to know when the service went down, and uh, again, more on that in a moment. So most of you in the room are probably aware that Esri and FME play very nicely together. It's one of the tightest application integrations, so there's all sorts of things that you can do uh, when you have both applications on the same machine. Um, what we were using here was the um, ArcGIS Online feature service, the ability to write out uh, to the AGOL uh, environment with the appropriate account credentials. And if you go to the hub, hub.safe.com, there's all sorts of little um, custom transformers you can download that do various things. Certainly some of the geocoding capabilities have now been uh, brought into the new um, uh, FME 2017 geocoder, but, um, and, and that's the way sometimes things on the hub migrate into standard functionality, but there's a geo-enriching service and uh, a bit of online routing that you can download and have a play with with your, uh, your account. And if you haven't played around with ArcGIS Online, the sort of standard map uh, looks a little bit like this. You can sign in and uh, uh, create yourself a, a map environment, and effectively that's um, uh, what the client did was they had a custom environment with their logo in it, all prepped with all their source data, and the, the missing element was the vessel positions. Um, the reason for the Google Fusion tables was, um, I mean, we've known about Google Fusion tables for some time, but um, the best thing is that FME can get there really easily, uh, non-spatial and spatial support uh, for their, uh, their Fusion table environment. Um, but the, the biggest discovery was that it doesn't count towards your Google Drive um, uh, free limit. So I think you get about 15 gig of free space with a Google account. Look in the bottom right-hand corner, zero bytes, Google Fusion table files are free. So you can just fill it up with as much stuff as you want, and it doesn't cost you a, a thing. So the other thing is we needed a Gmail, well, we needed an email account, uh, and having a Google account meant that we got the drive environment and a, a, a Gmail account in the same service. So it was uh, nice and neat and contained. 
This is a, a fusion table that we're just loading up. This is the one that we were effectively um, adding the incremental uh, load to so that um, uh, this is just two sample boats. These are cross-channel ferries. Um, and you can see when they're underway or when they're, they're moored, um, the status values in the, in the right-hand side. But we've also got lat long. We chose um, uh, the non-spatial environment because we could extract the content from there nice and quickly at any point and generate the geometry with the vertex creator point um, connector to join the line um, based on a time series so we could pick a particular time and uh, that was all nice and easy. Um, well, Wednesday, we know what he was up to, but um, uh, I was writing a workspace. Um, uh, again, very different individuals. Um, the, the workspace was all around hitting this service. Uh, if you go and, uh, well, if you, you were sitting in uh, Stuart's session uh, at the start of the week, he did a, a really good session around um, the HTTP caller and web services and APIs. Um, effectively, read the documentation, um, work out what the URL is, decide on what the response you want to be. Um, it, some services allow you to get back, in the case of the marine traffic service, XML, CSV, or JSON, your choice. So whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, have an account, put your API key into the request. The, the MMSI and then the value, that's the variable that you pass in. So that's the individual vessel ID. Uh, pass that in, you get back the JSON at the bottom. Um, uh, in this case, actually, XML response that uh, gives you the position of the, uh, of the boat. This is a workspace. Let's just break out quickly and, and show you that. Um, I'll be brief, but it's not that one. It is... Uh, okay, so it may be... The workspace? Yeah, no, that was the workspace. It's, there's not much to it, actually. The, the sample workspace that we sort of put together to prove we could do this looks a little bit like this. So effectively, um, we're just passing in a, a, a parameter that has in it um, a couple of MMSI values. So we just break those apart. So these are two sample boat IDs. Um, so really, this part of the workspace builds the URL. This makes the request. So the endpoint URL that we pass in is just literally got the MMSI um, ID on the end of it. Um, and then we create the point on the map. Um, and what we found actually was that if we paid a little bit more, we could get an extended response to tell us a bit more about the boat. So it would tell us things like um, the value of zero equals, well, it's underway using its engine. Um, and if we paid a little bit more, we'd get the name of the boat back. <laughs> Uh, if based on the ID, and if we paid a little bit more, we'd also get what type of boat it was. But if we have a fleet that's changing infrequently, we can save money by just hard coding it into this process and then subtly adjusting the process uh, every now and again based on the, the fleet value. Um, so, and then tag the location, uh, the, uh, the date that we're requesting the data. If I just run this, it'll hit the service. Uh, there's two boats it's gonna request. You'll see that one feature uh, makes its way uh, into here. Um, so there's um, one request that comes in effectively uh, and it gets broken out into two and two requests. And then over here, uh, at just because of the uh, Wi-Fi, you can see there's the, the two boats that are actually uh, underway at the moment. So this one is a, uh, a ferry. The ferry is called the Armorique and it's underway using its engine at the moment. Um, so this is the, uh, a, a very similar process to the one that we actually put into production. Um, so if I just dive my way through to here, uh, there we go. Um, we, when you're testing an API, you very quickly realize that um, you can break the API because you make lots of requests in testing. Uh, we found that out uh, and started to get some odd failures that we couldn't unpick. So we thought, well, we, it, it would be sensible for us to put some email notification in there so we can get notifications back when this thing is actually running. One of the reasons to do that when you're working with a, a web service is that um, you can um, get a history of when things went wrong from the service supplier and then use that as a stick to beat the service supplier with. So if their API goes down and they've promised you a certain response time, a, a amount of requests, uh, and you're paying for that service, if you don't get that, now you've archived when you didn't get that, and you can go back to them and say why. So we did that with, uh, uh, with a series of email notifications to know when the service went down. Um, and that was, um, that was a really strong uh, value add that FME offered. 
um, effectively a, a money-saving exercise to understand what was going on. This is a type of email that we sent back to the customer. Uh, and in this case, the, um, the error code that we scraped off the, uh, the service was a 503, meant that the service was down. So therefore, we can uh, justifiably go back and, uh, uh, and, and say we want a, 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 bit, a bit of a discount. So Craig's inspiration at the start really meant that there was a fairly obvious solution. FME on uh, AWS, Amazon Web Service, and FME Cloud solution was where we should go with this. Um, Thursday lunchtime, we, uh, we got our instance uh, provisioned. You just go through a quick wizard, uh, configure the instance. You get an indication of how long you're going to run it for. In actual fact, the customer ran it, uh, bought a 12-month subscription. You get a, a very significant discount. It's over, just over 40% discount on the pay-as-you-go model if you go for a 12-month subscription. Um, and that meant, because they were running it 24-7, 365, uh, and every two minutes, they, it, it got them uh, the, the value. Um, in a short time of clicking through the wizard, you effectively get to this stage where the machine is being provisioned, and literally 10 minutes later, you have an FME cloud instance, FME server on Amazon, ready. And you're a hop, skip, and a jump away then from literally taking your workspace that you've authored, publishing it to server, adding it to a schedule, and you can see there's an increment here, repeat every two minutes, uh, and it'll rerun the process, grab the latest vessel location, put the latest position on the map, and archive off the positions to that uh, table. And you've never seen three people in a conference room get more excited about six points on a map. You know, we had a bit of a hacking session to get to this point, and we had our points up on the map. ArcGIS Online gave us the ability to pre-style the points so that the um, the track, the pointing direction of the vessel could be orientated based on the, uh, on the icon that we chose so we knew which way it was going. So there's a, a subtle cartographic uh, addition that we could do in, uh, in ArcGIS Online. So, I mean, why did we choose FME? Well, the, the key thing was that there was literally one guy at the customer's side who'd never heard of FME before and he had no ability to get any development resource um, and it was such a short time frame. Um, they couldn't get any hardware up and running. Uh, they uh, had their cloud environment already with everything in it. It was ready to go. So that meant that FME Cloud was a bit of a no-brainer because the source data, the API, the positions are all in the cloud. That was going to come across into FME Cloud, be processed, and put into another cloud environment. So the data transaction cost, moving it in and out of the cloud environment, was minimal. So on top of their subscription, uh, it was a very um, small monthly amount that they were having to pay uh, to, uh, to have this service running. Um, and a, an odd part of the project, actually, an odd um, unique selling point of FME Cloud was that they could switch it off and not pay anymore. Um, they wanted to run this thing until the, end of, uh, until the end of the year. At that point, the project's over. They don't want ongoing costs. Therefore, they wanted a solution they didn't have to keep paying anything for. So it really allowed us to be, to be fast, to be agile, uh, but cost effective. Um, Friday, uh, we got the all clear. We could push the big red button and start it. And touching wood today, right now, every two minutes, it's running. And it's been running ever since. Every now and again, we get an email. The email says the service is down or something's gone subtly wrong. But we can keep that, uh, that monitoring process uh, through that, uh, that um, email inbox. Um, so Saturday, well, Craig's still busy, um, but, you know, I can start to relax. Now I can go and do the family shop. Uh, I could go to the supermarket and get some groceries. Um, you can imagine my wife taking these photos and us trying to avoid uh, people's eye contact. Uh, um, on Sunday, Craig, well, he's chilling, right? So there he is with his biceps <laughs> and his Lamborghini, and there I am with my wheelbarrow and my sort of average estate family vehicle. Um, so, you know, we are very different individuals, but um, uh, it, it was very much a, a good feeling at the end of the project, a really short project, really quick project. Uh, and um, all I'd say to you is um, go and give FME Cloud a try. Um, it's good fun, actually. Probably the, the best thing, the URL up there is a case-sensitive URL, allows you to go and sign up. $250 of free credit to have a play around with. There is now, obviously, announced the other day, an FME desktop uh, home use license. The two of those two things together, um, go and try something out that you care about. Um, go to the FME hub, download, I don't know, an Uber 
uh, web connection, or if you're a cyclist, play around with Strava. Do something that is fun for you, and then take that learning and take it into your, uh, into your day job. Uh, that's what I've done over the years. Uh, I've played around with FME in, uh, in, in private, much to people's disgust, often my wife's. Um, but um, that gives you a really uh, good uh, passion for, uh, for what you can do with technology if there's something, a club that you're in, something that matters to you. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'd, I'd very much like to thank Xiao Ming for, uh, well, for getting this opportunity to us in the first place, actually, uh, but taking part today. Thank you. Uh, and, and special thanks to Craig David, who knows nothing about this. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, so for the Marine Corps with APIs, did you have any concerns about there were any, if there's any data that was wrong coming from the API, or even just a chip that was not represented in the API that may exist to be floating around out there? Yeah, we did. Um, I mean, uh, there's a couple of things. Um, the one part of the project that, um, uh, the, the point with the vessel positions was it was just regulatory, and it, they, they really just needed to know, are these guys playing ball with the zone that they've been told they're allowed to, to work in? Um, so, I mean, we weren't using this for collision avoidance or anything, so uh, um, the health and safety aspect of it wasn't too much of an issue. And um, we also weren't getting uh, positional information of any other boat. So it was literally the ones that were doing the trenching or the cable laying. Oh, okay. So, uh, and, and actually, the other boat that we were watching was the inspector. So the guy who came out, because they, <laughs> they wanted to make sure, work out where he, that, that vessel was, um, so that... Uh, uh, they could, um, well, make sure they're <laughs> in, in line with what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, for the, for the, for the, or for the, uh, I said one, two. <laughs> there we go. Yo, 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 what up? <laughs> Denver in the house. <laughs> for the uh, for the APIs, I saw the JSON, XML, and CSV. Did yep. you, was there any conscious choice between which one you went with? That it, it was just down to uh, the, the response, the data was identical. Uh, there was nothing more or less offered in either one. I chose XML because I, I, I wanted to challenge myself. I hadn't played around with XML for a few weeks. So. Okay. Yeah. Anybody have one more? I can go one more. Well, let's, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Do we have one more question? Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the. Uh, for the, the charges on the uh, the marine traffic API, um, did you did you guys take in a lot of consideration to how how you were like paying for that or? Well, that was probably the 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 bit that was. I mean, so that that part we didn't have any control over. The client effectively set up that account and and managed that. I personally thought it was very expensive. Um, so um, that was that was an interesting element that that. You know, they the client had effectively chosen that uh, that service. Um, the, the per request was was significant. Actually, they, they it was effectively on a credit basis. So, um, yeah, I mean, they set up an account and, and ran it that way. So, I'm sure there are other alternatives. And uh, if we were to do this again, I'd be keen to look at alternatives for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>